Welcome to the Mid-City Church Sermon Cast. I'm so glad you're here. Today we're continuing our Lenten series called Vices. Get ready because the Sermon Cast begins now. You have probably heard of the composer named Mozart, but have you ever heard of a composer named Salier? Salier was an Italian composer, conductor, and teacher who became the epitome of Italian opera. He had such an impact that in 1774, he was appointed as the director of the Italian opera, as well as working for opera houses in Paris, Rome, and even Venice. He even helped mentor and train famous musicians. One of them is Ludwig van Beethoven. I mean, all of us know who Beethoven is, right? And Salier made a huge impact on opera and music altogether. Unfortunately, after 1804, about 1804, Salier stopped writing new operas and slowly his music began to disappear from the public eye until eventually his fame disappeared as well. But in 1979, about uh, 70 or 100 years later, a play titled Amadeus revived Salier's career and brought him back to the spotlight. Now, this fictional play begins by introducing us to Salier in his old age, admitting to the audience that he has poisoned Mozart in, in, in their young age and it promises to explain what happened and why. Now, throughout the play, we get the sense that Salier is having a hard time understanding how God would bestow so much talent upon a commoner like Mozart. And as the play continues to go on, Salier begins to renounce God for the fact that he does not have the talent, the same talent that Mozart has. See, in his mind, Salier sees himself as a more worthy possessor of such great talent. And yet, God never allows Salier to possess it. As a response to this, Salier becomes a public ally of Mozart in the play, while secretly trying to destroy Mozart's career and reputation until one day, in an attempt to have his name remembered throughout history, Salier decides to commit suicide and to leave a note behind, falsely confessing that he has murdered Mozart with poison. Unfortunately for for Salier, he survives this attempt. His confession is quickly proven false, and he winds up once again green with envy, knowing that he will always be second best to Mozart. Now, I'm going to go off on a limb and assume that your life has not been as dramatic as this portrayal of the relationship between Mozart and Salier. But let me ask you, have you ever felt the type of envy that Salier felt against Mozart? Have you ever looked at someone and been envious of what they had or they possessed, and you told yourself that if you only had what they had, that you would have the same amount of success as them, maybe even more than them? Have you ever felt that? If you have, that is the vice of envy living within you. Now, for clarity's sake, we will define envy in two ways. First, envy is, the want, is uh, wanting the very thing that belongs to another, something that we ourselves lack. So that can be someone's talent, someone's looks, even someone's genius, right? They have something that we don't have and we want it. Now, second, envy has a lot to do with one's own self-worth or lack thereof. In other words, uh, they have, the other person has the thing that we desire. And because of that, we will always be second best and nothing more. Right? And, and when we begin to believe that, our self-worth is constantly declining, and in, their, in our mind, theirs is constantly increasing. At least that's what we tell ourselves. Now, both of these uh, understandings of, of envy are very dangerous. See, wanting what, we belong to, what, what be, wanting what belongs to others and measuring our self-worth based on how we stack up against others is a no-win game that will lead us into a very dark hole of comparison and self-pity. Now, I'll be honest with you, out of all the vices we're going to talk about in this series, this is the one I struggle with the most. See, I thrive in the middle of competition. If I get placed in a room full of worthy adversaries, and I use those words intentionally, the very first thing I will do is to look around and understand what everyone's talents are, and I will quickly begin to compare myself to them. 
and I will do this quietly and from the shadows. I'll do it close enough for them to know that I am there, but quiet enough to listen to how they speak, to the stories they share, even the way they present themselves. And only after I know all of these things, only after I know that I will not be embarrassed if I stand toe-to-toe with them, do I finally begin to open up and show my true colors and thoughts and visions to people. Now listen, I am very good at this game, but I hate to play it. For starters, I have kept myself from developing friendships with people because in my head there is only room for one of us in the circle, in the situation, and considering that I'm planning on beating them out, uh, beating them out in this in this situation, why be friends with them in the first place? They're just going to leave anyway, right? I've also ruined friendships in my life because I began to see other people as competitors and not colleagues. See, in my mind, their success meant my failure. And I'll admit that there have been times in the past when I found myself sabotaging others, kind of like Salier did, sabotaging others in order for me to be the one who succeeded. But more importantly, my envy has led me to develop a hatred of myself, my own abilities, and even to see myself through a very different lens than the one that truly reflects reality. See, if I am not careful, envy leads me to doubt my self-worth, and I begin to tell myself that I will never be good enough until I begin, uh, uh, and, I, and I begin to, to believe these lies. Now, I probably don't need to tell you that this is not a healthy way of living life. My story isn't healthy. Sally Ayer's uh, life is not healthy either. But if you're like me and you struggle with envy, the solution uh, is actually pretty easy. There's actually three solutions to this that I can think of that I want to share with you today. First, we have to learn to see ourselves the way God sees us. Isaiah 43.4 says this, Because you are precious in my sight and honored and I love you, I give people in return for you, nations in exchange for your life. Now, this is such a meaningful scripture to me. Listen to the words again. You are precious. You are honored. You are loved by God. Let me say that again, because these words are so important. You are precious. You are honored. You are loved by God. You see, you don't need to earn it. You don't need to win it. You don't need to prove yourself or outsmart the competition or be better than anyone else. All you have to do is realize that no matter who you are or where you are in life, you are precious, you are honored, and you are loved by God. See, if we want to overcome the effects of envy in our lives, then we have to begin by understanding that we already possess the very things that envy tells us we seek or lack. We cannot allow envy to make us believe this lie about ourselves. The second thing we can do to overcome envy is to begin to participate in activities where competition is clearly non-existent. Now, let me say this. Ecclesiastes 4, chapter 9 says this. Two are better than one because they have a good reward for their toil. See, envy tells us that there is only one person who is able to gain a reward, right? If there's a competition, only one person can win. But the reality is that when we put ourselves in a position where we can begin to work together rather than against each other, we begin to see that the results are better off for everyone when we work together. And I truly believe that. We are better off when we work together than when we work against each other. So it's important that if we struggle with envy, we have to put ourselves in a position where we say no to working in competition against each other, and we begin to say yes to working together. We put ourselves in positions where, where my success is your success, and your success is my success, and together we can reach even bigger success. Lastly, if we want to overcome envy then we have to stop believing that others' approvals of us will somehow help us overcome our envy. Because I promise you that will not happen. Galatians chapter 1 verse 10 says this, Am I now seeking human approval or God's approval? Or am I trying to please people? If I were still pleasing people, I would not be a servant of Christ. See, if envy tells us that we have to keep working until we gain enough approval from others, then envy will always be in control in our lives. So in order to to overcome envy, we have to understand that there is nothing that people can say that will ever make us feel like we are enough, like like we, we are good enough. 
So in other words, the very thing that envy tells us we need is actually the thing that will make us go into a deeper hole, of, uh, into darkness, darker darkness. See, we have to stop seeking human approval. And instead, we have to allow God to remind us of who we are and our self-worth. See, we have to learn to see ourselves the way God sees us. We have to participate in activities where competition is non-existent. And we have to stop seeking the approval of others because none of those things will ever be enough. In her book, Vices, Rebecca De Young, uh, she says this, and she says it more eloquently than I will ever say it. She says this, to overcome envy, we need to work from a new, unconditionally loved vision of who we are. Friends, envy will distort the way you view yourself and the way you view others. And from self-experience, it's such a horrible place to do life from. But we can overcome this vice of envy by working from a new vision of who we are, one that tells us that we are enough, one that tells us that we are not in competition with each other, and one that no longer needs the approval of others. Friends, may we overcome envy because it will destroy us. May it be so. Amen. I hope you found this sermon to be meaningful and relevant to your life. If you'd like to dive deeper, I invite you to visit midcity.church slash sermoncast and click on the current sermon series. There you can find a home sheet for this sermon. That includes the scriptures that we talked about, questions to wrestle with, and a challenge to live out this week. While you're on the website, if you'd like to make a financial contribution to our ministry here at Mid-City Church, you can click the Give button in the top right corner. If you're new to the sermon cast, I invite you to text the word HERE, H-E-R-E, to the phone number 225-307-0662 and fill out a Connect card so that we can get to know you. I'm so glad you joined us today, and I look forward to seeing you next week.